I'm thinking if Benjamin Netanyahu were your doctor, this is what you would do. You have heart disease. No one is better at doing this than Ben Shapiro. You know that, bruh. We were here first. We have two choices. To die quietly or to fight with dignity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings be unto you. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the Best Medicine Podcast with me, Dr. Riyad Musa. This is part two of the Palestine-Israel solution. I did a podcast last week where I tried to express my thoughts about this heartbreaking situation and I tried to do it in a creative way. I tried to use the metaphor of disease, the metaphor of multi-system disease to describe what's happening in Palestine and Israel. And why did I use this metaphor? Because I'm trying to distill and clarify the problem to find solutions. This podcast is about finding solutions to problems and finding humor along the way. And my intuition tells me that if we look at this whole situation through the lens of health, through the metaphor of health, it's actually easy to see what we need to do. Now, I honestly thought that by the time I did part two of this podcast, there'd be a ceasefire. But it seems like bodies are still just piling up and... This whole situation is hitting me to the core of my being. I think many people can relate, especially parents, the amount of despicably horrific things that are being done to children that we've seen on social media. It's haunting. Um, In many ways, I feel lost and I'm confused and I'm trying to learn as much as I can about the situation. I'm trying to share as much knowledge as I can in order to try to make sense of this. I'm looking at the history to try and find patterns that we see over the course of history that have a disease-like nature. In the first podcast, I found a few of these diseases of the human heart, ideological diseases of humanity. I uh, metaphorically called it um, anti-Semitism, itis, colonialitis, pay hurt forward syndrome, and I'm going to talk about the treatment of these diseases a bit later on in this podcast. But it's clear from the comments that people have many different perspectives on what they see as the truth. Now, if people are saying all these divergent things, how do we actually find the truth? That's the fundamental problem here. We're all searching for beneficial knowledge, but how do we actually find the truth? And I think we can do it through this concept. Actions speak louder than words. It's important to listen to what people are saying, but it's more important to focus on what they are doing. We need to look at the outcomes because that will clarify, it will elucidate the lies. For example, if I'm telling my wife, if I, Riyad Musa, telling my wife, Fazana, babe, I'm not having junk food. I'm not eating takeout secretly behind your back. But at the same time, I'm getting fatter. My belly button is progressively getting deeper. Then the words that I'm speaking may not align with my actions. The outcomes will give you more insight into what is actually true and what is a lie. And one would think that all you need to do is look at history and the truth will reveal itself. But the problem with that is you can create a narrative with history based on what you live in and what you leave out. You can create a story based on the information that you omit or the information that you include. And this can distort truth a lot. Now, the Zionists will often say these days that they are indigenous to Israel. They were there first. No one is better at doing this than Ben Shapiro. You know that, bruh. We were here first. We're indigenous to this land. Facts don't care about your feelings. You know that, bruh. Facts don't care about your feelings. Ben Shapiro says things uh, very often with confidence and gusto and verve and vigor. Uh, I'm not sure how truthful the things he says are, but he says them confidently. We're here first. We're indigenous to the area. Facts don't care about your feelings. But now, here's the thing. When the Zionists first came and immigrated to Palestine. They were predominantly Europeans, bruh. White Europeans. You said you're indigenous. How's white Europeans indigenous to the Middle East? That's what I want to know. Meanwhile, the Palestinians, when these white European Zionists immigrated 
to Palestine. There were Palestinian people who were born on the land and living there. Their parents were born on the land living there. Their grandparents were born on the land. Their great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, all the descendants for centuries were living there. They had their own culture, traditions, music, food. Now, there were all sorts of religions in the area as well. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and there were different ruling empires over the time, Romans, Persians, Babylonians. But essentially, the ethnicity of the people was very consistent with that region. But now, white Europeans moving from Europe are saying they're indigenous. This is our land, because thousands of years ago, there were Jews living here. And I am Jewish. Therefore, I must be indigenous. Simple premise. Yeah, but brah, you white brah. Yeah, but my ancestors. Facts don't care about your feelings. At least I can be thankful that, you know, the Dutch settlers, the settler colonialists here in South Africa, they never used that tactic. They at least admitted we're colonizing the place. Jan van Riebeek was never like, now you see, I am indigenous to this area. We were indigenous because, you know, as everybody knows, all people come from, originally from Africa. All our ancestors are from Africa. Therefore, I am indigenous to this area. Facts don't care about your feelings. Now we need to talk about Hamas. We need to look at the stories or the narratives, try and find the truth. Piers Morgan asked Ben Shapiro why they can't negotiate with Hamas, like the British government did with the IRA. Two groups and two sides that were very, very far apart, sides that were killing each other, but still they were able to sit down and negotiate. And why can't Israel negotiate with Hamas? And then Ben Shapiro is like, well... The IRA had territorial ambitions. Hamas does not have territorial ambitions. They have genocidal ambitions. The Palestinian Authority has been offered multiple deals over multiple decades, and they've rejected without counter offers virtually every deal they've ever been offered. The Islamic Jihad is a terrorist group. Again, if the IRA was dedicated to the complete slaughter and eradication of every non Irish British here in the UK, that would be the equivalent of Hamas. Again, if they're successful in negotiations, it depends on the partner. The example that you're using is of sides very far apart coming together. Here we're talking about one side. Simple premise. If Israel put down all its guns tomorrow, every Jew in the region would be slaughtered. If Hamas puts down his guns tomorrow, Israel would leave the Gaza Strip alone. Facts don't care about your feelings. Okay, right. Okay, bra. The thing about Ben Shapiro... Dude, he says things that are not true like they are true. <laughs> you know it's ironic? It's ironic this dude. Ben Shapiro's initials are BS. Why? Because that's what he talks most of the time. Yeah, yeah, you'd leave Palestine alone, right? There's no Hamas in the West Bank, brah. They're chowing the West Bank, dude. Chowing it. Settlements everywhere, brah. This dude reminds me like of, you know, if Cartman from South Park... You know that, bruh. If he grew up and became Jewish. Facts don't care about your feelings. It's fake. My third hand. So his angle is always that Israel behaves perfectly. They model beacons of behavior. And Hamas. They don't care about liberating Palestine. They just want to kill the Jews. It's fake. My third hand. Now, it's very difficult to deal with a person like this because he seems to have no remorse in lying. Right? Or maybe he's not lying. Like, maybe he's using that technique. It's not a lie if you believe it. You know that technique. You know, I don't quite connect with his nature. He's very intelligent and he uses his quite significant intellect and verbal ability not to find the truth, but rather manufacture what he wants to communicate. But I can't just relegate this issue to Ben Shapiro's penchant or tendency to lie. Yuval Hariri Noah, he says similar things about Hamas, but he is a very thoughtful person, seems to have a kind heart. Um, he's famous for his book, Sapiens. I don't know if you've read the book, but it's quite brilliant. Now, Yuval Hariri Noah says, nothing frightens Hamas more than the possibility of peace. And the way the attack was conducted, they want to implant seeds of hatred in the minds of millions to make sure there will never be peace. 
there is a competition of suffering. Each side wants to draw attention to its immense pain. There is no winner in the competition of suffering except Hamas. They don't care about anything that happens in this world. This, I know, for many Westerners, is difficult to grasp. The level of religious fanaticism you have in my region of the world is in many ways incomprehensible. But we need to grapple with this. The Hamas terrorists. They don't care what is happening in this world. They don't care about human suffering. Even on their side, they are fixated on the joys of paradise, which is why they are in love with death. Now, once again, he's talking about Hamas like they have no humanity. Look, yeah, they don't want to say that the issue is the Palestinians are in a cage and they're mistreated. That's not the story. The, the story is that just Hamas are evil and they want to kill all the Jews. The Prime Minister of Israel said, uh, this is a struggle between the children of light and the children of darkness, between humanity and the law of the jungle. Another military person says, the IDF is the most moral army in the world. We are trying to prevent hurt civilians, but we're not fighting like a regular state. We are fighting monsters. Our goal is one, to eliminate Hamas from the earth. Remember that general he said, I have ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. There will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting animals and we will act accordingly. Right, so no relief agency is allowed in because you're fighting animals. At least let the SPCA in, brah. You're fighting the animals, at least let the SPCA come in and look after the Palestinians. So they communicate a lot of things. They communicate that they're the most moral people on earth. And they always say that Hamas has no humanity. This is what they say all the time. So here's the question. What does Hamas say? Because we're hearing a lot about what other people say Hamas say. What does Hamas actually say? Now, I got a hold of the 2017 charter. This is the latest Hamas charter. Point 16. This is important. Hamas affirms that its conflict is with the Zionist project, not with the Jews, because of their religion. Hamas does not wage a struggle against the Jews because they are Jewish but wages a struggle against the Zionists who occupy Palestine. Okay, so that's an interesting little tidbit. And then they say, Hamas rejects any alternative to the full and complete liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea. However, without compromising its rejection of the Zionist entity and without relinquishing any Palestinian rights, Hamas considers the establishment of a fully sovereign and independent Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital along the lines of the 4th of June 1967. That's the 1967 borders. With the return of the refugees and the displaced to their homes from which they were expelled. So that's what Hamas says. And then I saw this interview on Sky News with Hamas, with Dr. Basim Naim, I think. You know, with that Sky News, that old dude, that old car, you look, always looks stressed out, that bruh. He was like, um, Dr. Naim, because of your actions on the 7th of October, the 2 million people you represent in Gaza are going to have no fuel, no food, no water. Is that looking after the people of Gaza? And then Dr. Naeem was like, You are describing the situation of 17 years. For 17 years, we haven't electricity, we haven't water, 80% poverty, 60% unemployment rate, 55% malnutrition, around 70% of our people are young people who have no vision, no future, no horizon of any better life in the future. Therefore, you are already describing the current situation. We are not occupying Israeli city. We are not colonizing Israel. We are not laying besiegement to Israeli population. We are not imposing a system of racial domination and apartheid. They are doing that to us. We are rocking the doors of the biggest open hair prison to have better life. We have two choices, to die quietly or to fight with dignity. 
Right. So that's what Hamas says. The Israeli perspective is that they're not humans. They don't care about their own people. They're not really interested in liberating Palestine. They just want to kill Jews, right? And what I get from reading what they say is more like they're uncompromising dudes. They're like, this is my home. My home. F*** you. That's what it comes across as. It doesn't come across like they're out to slaughter all Jews. I don't think... Jerry Seinfeld in New York has to worry about Hamas jumping out of a bush. Jew! <laughs> you know, it's a thing about, you know, you are in my house! F*** you! Get out! You know, where the PLO is more like, you know, able to negotiate. Let's make peace. You know, you are here now, okay. We'll have to deal with it, you know. It's not cool. You kick us out of our land, but you know, you're here now many years. Just let's figure it out, you know. Hamas, f*** you, this is my house. <laughs> but it's still within the context of Islamic principles, which clearly they did not utilize when they broke out of, when they committed those things on the 7th of October. But they seem to be doing that with the hostages. I don't know if you saw when they released that granny. <laughs> Uh, my mom is speaking about uh, the time there. She's telling us about um, sharing food with the people. That the people, when she first arrived, they, they told them that they are Muslims and they're not going to hurt them. Um, and that uh, they shared, they ate the same food that their. Uh, um, the, um, the Hamas was eating. So that auntie shook their hands, bro. She said the shalom, salam. And then they asked her at the press conference why. And she said... My mom is saying that they treat them kindly and provide for them. Islamically, that's how you're supposed to treat prisoners of war. Upon capture, Islamically, the prisoners must be guarded and not ill-treated. Islamic law holds that the prisoners must be fed and clothed, either by the Islamic government or by the individual who has custody of the prisoner. Prisoners must be fed in a dignified manner. They must not be forced to beg for their subsistence. Muhammad's early followers also considered it a principle to not separate prisoners from their relatives. And after the fighting is over, prisoners are to be released. Prisoners are not to be forced to convert to Islam. There is no compulsion in the religion. The freeing of prisoners by Muslims themselves is highly recommended as a charitable act. The Quran also urges kindness to captives. The freeing of captives is recommended both for expiation of sins and is an act of simple benevolence. I'm not saying Hamas is not willing to perpetrate indiscriminate acts of violence. That's clearly not the case. But it also doesn't fit that the main aim in life is the genocide of Jews and they have no care or heart or any ability to um, uh, be gentle and kind. To find truth, you have to see what people do, not really what they say. That'll give you more insight. And then there's a question of moral equivalency. Ben Shapiro is always like, there is no moral equivalency between Israel and Hamas. Hamas terrorists want to kill all Jews. They want to slaughter them. Israeli heroes want to kill Hamas. That's it. Yeah, but you're killing thousands of babies at the same time. You don't see any problem with that. Yes, but we're not trying to kill the babies. We're not trying. We're trying to kill Hamas. Okay, okay. If you're not trying, at least admit that you're doing a fantastic job at killing babies. you clearly gifted at it. Like, you're not even trying and like 4,000 babies obliterated, 10,000 civilians gone, bruh. And you're not even trying. Imagine, imagine if you were trying. How many babies would you kill, bruh? You clearly got talent, bruh. You're the goat of killing babies. And then this idea that always go, but they're using the kids as human shields. Using the children as human shields. The issue is, I don't think that they're using the babies as human shields. I think the issue is that you don't seem to care. How are you supposed to get Hamas? Not shoot the babies? Yes, I think so. Don't shoot the babies. You know, because you say you're the most moral army in the world. Yes. Like in the movies, when the bad guy takes a hostage, I will, I will kill her. I will kill her. The good guy goes, okay, okay, buddy. Calm down, buddy. I'm putting it down. Calm down. 
Let's work this out. Right? The good guy doesn't go, get the bazooka. Let's kill everybody. <laughs> you know? At the press conference afterwards, he doesn't go, I, I killed the evildoer. Yay! But where are the hostages? Oh, I killed them too. Took them all out. Yeah, just the whole orphanage destroyed it. I, uh, what? How else was I supposed to get the bad guy? They were using the, uh, the hostages' human shields. Collateral damage. It's like, it's insane. They're using the hostages' human shields. What do you expect them to do? We're the most moral army on earth. We're so moral. We have to get Hamas. Here's a thought. If you, as the most moral army on earth, feel it's correct and moral to kill thousands and thousands of babies to get a demon, I submit to you that maybe you're not trying to kill the demon. You are the demon. If it's worthwhile to kill thousands upon thousands, blow them up, obliterate them, right? You're not trying to kill. That's the demon is there, bro. What are you supposed to do? Like not kill Hamas and save the babies? Makes no sense. How are you supposed to kill Hamas? Maybe it's sending like, like special forces, bruh. You know those brasso with the night vision goggles? You know those guys that go, the brasso that killed Osama bin Laden. I'm not saying these people are lying. Who knows? It's just, you know, look at what people are doing and look at the outcomes and the evidence because they come up with quite interesting stories. The president of Israel has told Sky News that some of the Hamas fighters who carried out the October the 7th attack were carrying instructions on how to make chemical weapons. Isaac Herzog says Israeli forces discovered the material on the body of dead fighters in Kibbutz Beri. This is material which was found on the body of one of those sadistic villains. It's Al-Qaeda material, official Al-Qaeda material. We're dealing with ISIS, Al-Qaeda and Hamas. This Wait, is that laminated, bruh? That's, that's just... <laughs> Wait, let me just watch this. Okay, but it's laminated. Are you sure it's Al-Qaeda material? Us, this is what we're dealing with. It looks like it was made on Microsoft Word. It's okay. Hamas is not like too technically advanced. I mean, we all know this. I mean, they're not. Their military is definitely not. Most of Israel's uh, military aircraft is obtained from the USA. They have A4 Skyhawks, F4 Phantom IIs. F-15 Eagles, F-16 Fighting Falcons, F-35 Lightning Twos. You've seen our master's Air Force. They're paragliders. Yeah, that's the Air Force, right? They get the uh, military aircraft from uh, paraglider.com. Okay, and now they have instructions for chemical weapons. Okay. And in, those, in, and in this material, there were instructions how to produce chemical weapons. This is, it speaks about uh, 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 arson and it speaks uh, uh, about uh, uh, various chemicals uh, that uh, come out and produce chemical weapons. Simple as that. It's simple as that. They're producing the chemical weapons uh, because I held a laminate and uh, it's proof that, uh, you know, they have chemical weapons capabilities. They have weapons of mass destruction. Okay, not weapons of mass. Uh, they used that already in the Iraq war. Okay, okay. Um, I must come up with new material. Okay. Dude, at least come up with new material. George Bush already used that. You know, and understand, like, it works. This is, it's hack, it's hack material, but it works, bro. They killed, like, I think, like a million Iraqis died because of the lie of weapons of mass destruction, right? So it works. It clearly works. Why can't you use the, the chemical weapons thing? Yeah, okay. Among the, the, the sort of the information that you've retrieved from the bodies of these terrorists, um, there was a USB drive that contained um, evidence uh, that suggested that they had some kind of manual for um, developing chemical weapons. Orders were there. Orders were there to how to kill, how many to kill, how many to take as sausages. Orders were there to rape. It was not something that happened just at least that someone has to do it. All was written and ordered for them. All was written and ordered. 
that thing with the lup all was written and ordered okay i'm not saying the guys lying but it seems strange that they would have clearly denoted instructions on what to do on the body when they kept the whole operation the whole operation extremely secret that seems weird bro what were the like Hamas guys before they were going to go in okay okay guys okay guys the idf has no idea we are coming they they don't know even though there are thousands upon thousands of spies here in Gaza we've kept this operation secret for a very very long time we prepared for months even years we've got our weapons we've got our paragliders we've got our pickup trucks we've got our gopro cameras so we can film what we are doing i think we are ready wait wait where is the evidence where is the usb drives with clear instructions on how to build a bomb and and step by step notes written on microsoft word on how many people we need to rape and kill we need to put that keep that all on ourselves and and bo write boom a lot you know write boom demon emoji and uh, and and maybe ahmad the dead terrorist meme you know that guy i kill you that guy to clearly show we we are uh, evil we are demons Whew. These guys are so truthful. They the most truthful people in the world. <sighs> All right, so based on everything, I think it's diagnosis time again, people. You know, it's time to play doctor and uh, once again diagnose issues that uh, I've noticed. Um, hopefully provide some treatment. Okay, so first of all, the Israeli government is suffering from a condition known as Pinocchio Rhea, right? Also known as Ben Shapiro syndrome or BS syndrome for short. Um, this is where you have a compulsive need uh, to talk BS and do it without any remorse whatsoever. You just have to add confidence to what you're saying and uh, people will believe it, you know? Up is down. Up is, he said it loudly with confidence. Anybody who doesn't believe that up is down is Jew-hating. You're trying to kill all Jews. Facts don't care about your feelings. And I'm not sure uh, whether the people are being deceptive on purpose. I'm not sure what the motivation is. My sense is that Ben Shapiro is being deceptive on purpose. I think um, he doesn't care about lying. I think it's purely... A means to an end and the end is complete eradication of uh, the Palestinian people them being like pushed out you know they're gonna chow more and more of the West Bank they're gonna push uh, the Gazans into the desert that is the ultimate aim they're gonna build a big wall around the place and they're going to uh, live in their enclave then there's also the other factor where there are people who are lying to themselves they're suffering from cognitive dissonance also known as a will smitheria um, where you feel and you see yourself as a moral person but you're doing a distinctly immoral thing and uh, these two ideas do not equate i'm being called on in my life to love people and to protect people and to be a river to my people. They have cognitive dissonance. Now, the way in which you actually I get insight into this. You can utilize Johari's window, which is a personal development tool. It's a personal development tool, but I think it can also be utilized in this context. So you have one area called the open area. This is the area that's known to self and known to others. There's a blind spot area that is not known to self and known to others. Then there's a hidden facade area which is known to self but not known to others and then there's an unknown area which is not known to anyone it's information waiting to be discovered now for your blind spot i feel a lot of people especially like yuval hariri noah have that they see themselves very differently to how other people are seeing them i think he's seeing himself as anakin skywalker many people see israel as that they see themselves as anakin skywalker when in fact they represent Darth Vader. <laughs> 
The treatment for this, now finally we get to the treatment after all of that. These diseases, I think, can affect all of humanity. Every single one of us, it's not relegated to a specific race or ethnicity of people. Everyone is vulnerable to these conditions, but they must be treated. Now, how they treated these conditions in the past was with a pathogen model. Most times during history, right, they use the pathogen model or the parasite model. This is an evil pathogen and we need to exterminate this pathogen and get rid of it. And then once you exterminate this pathogen and get rid of it, everything will be better. No, this has never ever worked. We need to change the whole treatment pattern to a human model. The human model involves looking at everything holistically, like we do now in medicine. See what are the causes of the condition. Now, in the past, they used to use the pathogen model. For example, during the time of slavery, if there was a slave revolt using the pathogen model, they used to hang the slaves. If the slaves are revolting, came into the house, what's the cure for that? Hang the slaves and show the other slaves how we hung the slaves as an example. And that cures the condition using the pathogen model. During apartheid here in South Africa, if Nelson Mandela was part of Mkonto Wesizwe, the spear of the nation, which is the armed resistance wing of the struggle, if he engages in acts of sabotage, then you must, according to the pathogen model, either try and hang Nelson Mandela after a treason trial or put him in prison for the rest of his life which they tried to do. He ended up being in prison for 27 years. That's the pathogen model. That's how we treat this condition. During the Holocaust, they used the pathogen model to exterminate the Jewish people or the Native Americans. They used the pathogen model, right, to exterminate the Native Americans. And now they put them in reservations that as the pathogen model. But this model just breeds more pain and it's not a cure. We should look at this whole thing more like heart disease. Look at it holistically. Like we are all part of one humanity. Now, let's say there's heart, a heart disease, right? If you have a heart attack, usually like there's a blockage in the vessel. So you have a vessel going to the heart, right? And that gets blocked by, let's say, an atheroma, and that's a little blockage. Now, the way in which you treat that, in the past, you used to drill through the sternum, use like retractors, pull the rib cage apart, do a bypass operation on that vessel to ensure blood flow to the heart. Now, these days, we are much more advanced technologically. So what we do, try and avoid drilling through the sternum and opening up the rib cage. More often these days, what they do is they make an incision in the femoral artery and they pass a catheter up the femoral artery. They do an angiogram. We can see where the blood vessels are going and they find the blockage in that blood vessel and they put a little stent in there to open up that atheromatous blockage. Now, there are certain causes of the atheroma. Doctors always look at the causes. And what are these causes? Smoking, eating excessively, junk food, and not exercising. Now, I'd like to use that analogy to describe this situation. Let's assume the atheroma, the atheroma is Hamas. And the Hamas has caused the heart attack. The, the hematheromatous plaque, right, has caused a heart attack. And um, the causes of an atheroma, I just want you to imagine that smoking is war, blowing people up. Eating excessively is taking more and more of the West Bank and Palestinian territory, taking more and more by building more and more settlements, occupying Palestine. Not exercising is not giving people freedom, self-determination. I'm thinking if Benjamin Netanyahu were your doctor, this is what you would do. You have heart disease, evil heart disease. So what we need to do is smoke as much as possible. Change smoke and smoke and smoke, maybe even suck an exhaust pipe. Number two, you need to eat as much as you can. Just eat as much junk food as possible. Also, you need to stop exercising. Exercising is no good. Now, I'm not going to pass a catheter up to try and surgically just remove the hematheroma. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is like, I'm going to drill through the sternum, rip your rib cage open, rearrange your internal organs. We may have to destroy the lungs because the hematheroma, which is an evil atheroma, is using the lungs as organ shields. And we will not rest until we remove that hematheroma. We're not dealing with a normal atheroma here. We're dealing with an evil, monstrous atheroma. Atheroma animals, and we need to treat them as such. Take two panados and call me in the morning.
That's if Benjamin Netanyahu were your doctor. It's interesting he's wearing the white coat over there. But that's not because he's a doctor, it's because he's a butcher. So, first of all, we need to get rid of this pathogen model for humanity. Right? We need to have a human model, we need to have a heart model. When we use the pathogen model with slavery, right? When there was a slave revolt, what did you do? You hung the slaves, right? When you use the heart model, what do you do? In slavery! Yay! Give people freedom rights. In apartheid, right? If you use the pathogen model, right? It's logical. Put Nelson Mandela, he's a terrorist, put him in prison for his own life, right? If you use the heart model, end apartheid. Give people rights, freedom. Yay! That's the treatment. And I'm not saying anything that is unusual. We all know this. This is 2023. 2023 and We've done this over and over and over and over again. We all know the cure is rights, freedom, equality. And we from South Africa, we had apartheid here. We had discrimination and we still do. Right? But under the rule of law, everyone has equal rights. We have political freedom now. Under the law... We all are equal. Like in South Africa, there's no problems between Jewish people and Muslim people. There's no issues. Like I've done my best work, right, with Jewish people. Jewish people who I love. And there's no issues, right? There's no issues because we all live in a land where we are equal. There's no issues. It's just about rights. It's not, it's not actually complicated. We need to make the game of life as fair as possible. There's always going to be a competition. That's also how we find the best amongst us. But the rules of life have to be fair. The rules of the game of life have to be fair. And I think number one rule, I think we can start here. And I can't believe that I'm saying this in 2023. Number one rule, stop killing the children. In 2023, children cannot be collateral damage. The death of children is not a necessary evil. It can't be a subordinate principle. It can't be there. It's the principle. In Islam, it said that if you take one innocent life, it's like killing all of humanity. The children are not statistics. Right? Because if it's your child, that's not a statistic. That is everything. It's everything. And I thank Allah that I have my children. I've got four children. And I feel so, I feel so horrible for the, the fathers, for the mothers, for the parents that have lost their children. The lives just snuffed out. For, for, for what? And we are all the same. And we need to start seeing each other as the same. The Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in his final sermon, there is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab and of a non-Arab over an Arab. And there is no superiority of a white person over a black person or of a black person over a white person except on the basis of good deeds. That's all that matters. Our deeds. And you can't do this to children. Sorry. You can't do this to kids. You can't do this to kids. 